So let's just get started. I'm going to share this poll um, just so we can see who's on the line with us. We have lots of parents, a few adults and researchers, um, doctors, relatives of people with autism. Um, okay. So Wendy, let's kick things off with a general question about you. So people were curious about what inspired you to become a doctor. So this goes way, way back. Um, when I was growing up, my parents were sort of doing things that ultimately I ended up doing a little bit of both of. So my father was a researcher. He was an organic chemist by training and he actually developed drugs. So he was the one that literally from a chemical point of view um, made drugs uh, to be able to make people better. My mom worked at hos in hospitals and in clinical laboratories, clinical diagnostic laboratories. And so watching them as I was growing up, um, I got to see what really was fulfilling to them uh, and what inspired them and what inspired me. Um, neither of them were physicians per se, so they weren't doctors in that same way. Um, but when I was growing up and in high school, in college rather, I got the chance to spend some time at the National Institutes of Health. And that's some of you have seen Dr. Fauci. Uh, he actually works at the National Institutes of Health and that's where they do a lot of the research that ultimately um, we hope makes people better in the future. And as part of that experience, although I was intended to be in the laboratory, um, one of the things that I got the chance to do was to see what was going on in the main hospital there. And that really sort of inspired me to not just do research, but to actually be a physician scientist to do, both do the, the doctoring part of it and do the research part of it. And since then, that's the track I've been on and um, have loved doing it. It really was a great fit, at least for me. Okay. Um all right, so um, we got this question, we got this a few times. Um, people are curious about um, how you decided to start Spark and all the research associated with Spark. Yep. So um, I am a physician. Um, I'm also, I think people know a geneticist. And within that area, um, I see a lot of children. So being a pediatric geneticist and as a pediatric geneticist, I would have a lot of families and uh, children come to me who had autism. And I've been doing this part of things for about 25 years. And I have to say that I got really frustrated um, by saying, I don't know. Um, and I felt like for the first few years of my career, I would just say that over and over again, I don't know. And then when they would ask me about things that they could do to try and relieve some symptoms or make some things better, I was still left with the, I don't know. I don't even really understand what's different about your child's brain to make them sort of have those challenges or what we can do to help that. And that got really frustrating for me. And so that's kind of the story of my life in terms of being a physician. When I get to the point where I have questions, families have questions, patients have questions, and I don't have the answer, then that's when I go across the street to my research laboratory and we start finding the answers to those questions. And I could see a time um, sort of even starting 20 years ago where in, as a geneticist, I could often say, I knew the experiment we needed to do and I wanted to do, um, but we didn't necessarily have the ability to do it. And so I've been thinking for actually about 20 years now that we needed to do Spark. Um, we didn't necessarily have the tools. We couldn't afford to be able to do what we, we are doing now, but I could see that that's what the field was going to need in large part because when we talk about autism, it's not just one condition. And if you talk with you know, even the families that we have online and compared stories, there are some things that are similar, but everyone's different, everyone's unique. And it made me realize that we had to give the opportunity for everyone to be represented and everyone to be able to contribute in their own unique way. Otherwise they'd be left behind. They'd be left out of the future that I hope will include better treatments and better supports uh, for some individuals who need that. Um, so as we were doing that, like I said, this, this idea has been percolating in my mind for about 20 years or so. And as we first at the Simons Foundation started out with one um, study that we called the Simons Simplex Collection, it was proof of principle that the ideas that I've been thinking about and many other as well, I, I don't want to take the sole credit for this, but that 
uh, collectively, it was the right idea, but it just wasn't big enough. The Simon Simplex collection was extremely well done and included about 2,500 families with autism. Um, but you could see based on that, that we still had a long way to go, a lot to learn. And in particular, the uh, that particular study, I, I, I mean, it was incredibly valuable. It was also not easy for everyone to participate. You needed to be near one of the centers. You had to have the time to take off of work to come in and go through a full day evaluation. Um, and so we really wanted to open this up so that everyone who wanted to contribute would have that opportunity. And, you know, the and just to be clear about what I'm talking about, Spark is really meant to be the what powers autism research for decades to come. That's that's what we're trying to do here and realizing that it's not gonna be over in a year or two. It's really going to be something that I think is, is already powering the research community and will continue to power the research community, as I said, uh, I think for decades to come. All right, so that said, how can families and autistic adults get more involved in SPARK? Oh, that's great. Well, so obviously, if you're not already part of Spark, it's really easy to do. You can literally go online now or tonight and go for sparkforautism.com. Um, this is set up so that you can do it remotely anytime, any day that you want to. Like I said, you don't have to go into a clinical site, but we do have 31 incredibly powerful clinical centers around the country. Um, all of the best universities and autism centers that you'd recognize all our partners to be able to work with families um, in their individual cities. Um, if you're already part of Spark, um, sometimes I know it's hard to uh, sort of remember your password. At least I can say for myself, I always forget my password. But if you haven't been on for a while, you can go on and log in. And if you forgot your uh, account or you forgot your password, um, you can always go in and uh, ask, go to the contact us and even send an email in with a question if you get if you have trouble with anything, that's just a general bit of advice. Um, but when you do log in, you'll see uh, online your dashboard. Um, and for those who haven't done all of the activities on your dashboard, um, if you haven't sent in a saliva kit and you wanna do that to participate in the research, certainly you can do that part of it. If you wanna fill out some of the surveys uh, that tell us a little bit about yourself or about the person in your family with autism, you can do that. And, um, and I'm sorry, I said, uh, I may have misspoken, sparkforautism.com, if I said that wrong. Um, and uh, for those individuals who want to be part of what we call research match, one of the things that we do that I probably didn't explain well enough before was that we have uh, researchers around the country, literally over 100 research projects that we've been uh, supporting. And researchers can invite you to participate in their research. Now, you don't have to participate if you don't feel like it's the right study for you or if it's not the right time for you. Um, but that's another way you can contribute to their individual research programs. Um, and we share that information back. So we have summaries of the research that we're finding um, and to be able to make sure that you as a participant be able to learn with us. We want you to be right there, um, you know, being able to understand the same things we're understanding in the same time frame we're understanding. So all of those are ways to contribute. Um, I alluded to, to it before, but I want to make sure it's really clear. Um, when we talk about autism, everyone really has to represent themselves to make sure that they're also going to benefit from that. So in other words, because there are so many different, you know, sort of variations along the autistic spectrum, um, you know, what may be applicable to even your next door neighbor may have nothing to do with you. So, you know, some people with autism have problems sleeping and others don't. And, you know, if you want to be able to come up with a solution to your sleeping problems, you have to make sure that you're represented within those studies that we have that are looking at sleeping so that we can find better sleep aids or sleep habits or things that are going to be working for you. Um, so as we do that, though, we do know that although everyone's unique, we do know that by sort of clustering people together who have similar symptoms, we're going to help each other. And so as we're doing this, um, we do want to make sure as a community we're there for each other. And I know it's a tough time right now, but um, we at Spark are absolutely committed to, to you all. Um, and so we, we need to be able to, like I said, make sure that we're, we're, we work for you and we want to make sure that we're representing you. Great. Okay. Um, all right. So let's dive into some um, genetics questions. Um, so someone 
sent in the question, uh, what so far has been the biggest surprise the Spark team has found in its genetic research? And similarly, what is the team most excited and hopeful for in regard to its genetic research? So um, I'll tell you a little story and this will help you understand the biggest surprise to me. So I alluded to it already, but uh, when I started at the National Institutes of Health, I was working on a condition that as geneticists, we know very well, a condition called phenylketonuria. Um, and in fact, um, most of your children were screened for phenylketonuria when they were newborn babies, right after they were born, when they went home from the hospital, we usually do a heel stick to get a drop of blood and then screen for this condition, because if we find that it's there, we can actually put a child on a very special diet. I have to admit, it's not a tasty diet, but it's a very special diet that can prevent them from having brain challenges in the future. Well, when we were doing the analysis of the SPARC data, um, we were looking for genes that we know of that cause autism. And these are literally dozens, over a hundred genes as we started looking for this. Um, and although we're looking specifically for genes for autism, occasionally we see other genetic factors that are related to autism and other developmental disorders. Um, and we came across a young person that actually, had, it looks like, had phenylketonuria. And I started scratching my head saying, but gosh, golly, you know, this is the type of condition that at the time this child was born, I would have expected them to have been tested for that, screened for that and diagnosed with that. Um, and we went back and long story short, um, we returned that information to the family. In fact, that is the correct diagnosis. Phenylketonuria is that child's condition. Um, I'm very happy to say that, you know, they're tr being treated appropriately by good doctors who know how to treat that. Um, but unfortunately for that child, that, that was a diagnosis that had it been made, I won't say exactly how many years to protect the privacy, but had it been made in the normal time frame uh, when that baby was a newborn, it would have had a very different outcome. Um, and so that was something really shocking to me. Um, unfortunately, I mean, obviously, you know, shoulda, woulda, coulda, uh, you know, I can't go back now at this point, but um, I hope that we'll be able to identify more treatable causes of autism. I'm not purporting that most of the findings we're going to have are something where we can just change a diet and immediately fix it, but I do dream of the day when we will be able to come up with very specific ways of supporting individuals in terms of education, in terms of some of the daily challenges, and maybe maybe for some of them, we'll actually be able to come up with molecular treatments, genetically based treatments, maybe not gene therapy, but something that's going to be targeted to what their particular genetic um, sort of finding is. I don't know what percentage that's gonna be. I don't know when it's gonna be, um, but that certainly is what we're excited and hopeful for. And in looking at some of the other studies that are coming along, I'll digress for just a second to say that uh, as a pediatric geneticist, I also early in my career learned about a condition called spinal muscular atrophy. It's not related to autism, um, but it is or was, I'm going to use the past tense, was the most common genetic cause of death for children less than two years of age. Um, and we have in my lifetime, and, and I don't consider myself that old, but we have in my lifetime gone from that statement that I just made to now being able to screen for that and giving those newborns with that condition gene therapy, which is life-saving and life-altering, completely different course for them. And based on that, there are a lot of lessons that we're learning from spinal muscular atrophy, that we're learning from Angelman syndrome, a different genetic condition, um, but things that we didn't think were gonna be as easy to treat, that wouldn't be as easy to reverse, that at least we're seeing some at least some evidence that portion of this is reversible. And, and I don't have a crystal ball, like I said, to know exactly the timing of when or which conditions necessarily, but it is definitely cause for hope and celebration um, that I do think there, there are things that are evolving and that we're learning. And there's so, in, in some ways, so many similarities that if we can break through some of these technological issues it's going to be what I call a step function. That is that when we see progress, I don't think it's gonna be linear that we're just gonna make itty bitty steps sort of year by year. I do think there are gonna be some technological breakthroughs that are gonna open up doors for many people all at once. And part of what we're doing is trying to get everyone lined up, ready for those 
um, possibilities and also to, for us to be able to advocate so that researchers that are working on something sort of make it easy for them to work on autism, be able to make it that it's, you know, just easy peasy lemon squeezy, like my son would say, um, and be able to get the brightest minds, the smartest people, attract them to autism research so that we can um, be able to make, have them work for us as well. Okay. Um, okay, so now some more questions about genetics. Um, we got a few questions about um, heritability and autism. So can you explain a little bit more about that? Um, if there's a chance of passing a, a gene change related to autism onto offspring? Sure. So as I was saying, autism is complicated um, and it's definitely not, not monolithic and not just one cause. And I'll also say that although I'm a geneticist and I'll be talking a lot about genetics because uh, folks wrote in about that, I wanna be clear, not everything is genetic. I realize that, I appreciate that. There's a spectrum and I know this is gonna get complicated so I'll try and take this a uh, little bit slowly. In some individuals with autism, there is definitely a genetic basis and there's one single gene that's really powerful. And had it not been for that gene, I can pretty much rest assured that that individual wouldn't have autism. For those particular genetic variants, they are oftentimes not inherited. So for those particular really powerful, really strong genetic factors, we often find that they are de novo or new in the child and not coming from either of the parents. Neither of the parents have autism, neither of the parents have any of those neurological uh, challenges. It started brand new with the child. I also wanna tell all the moms and dads who are out there, um, there is nothing that you could or would or should have done to prevent that. So it wasn't uh, something that, you know, based on a glass of wine you had before you realized you were pregnant, based on, I don't know what you might have been exposed to at work or what cleaning fluids you used. None of that, you know, was responsible. These are things that just happen and they happen to all of us. And I can say this because I've done this experiment. They happen to my children. They've happened to, you know, everyone I've ever looked at. Everyone has some of these new genetic changes. None of us is immune from that. But for some of these folks with autism, they happen to land in a gene for autism and they happen to be a very powerful type of change. So that's at the one end of the spectrum, if you will. For other people, we don't find any of those de novo changes in autism genes, but in those individuals, we believe that it's inherited factors, but probably not just one factor. In many cases, not two or three, but in many cases, dozens of genetic factors. And it's the combination of all of those factors together that increases the risk of autism. Now, one of the things that we have hope for uh, when it comes to the future is that early brain development may be malleable, may be plastic. And so one of the things that researchers are looking at to the future is if you knew that someone were at risk for autism, either because of family history or prematurity or an infection or um, genetics or anything that could cause autism, could we do something early in life when the brain is still plastic to be able to put that child, put that baby even on a different trajectory so they wouldn't have some of those same social challenges in terms of connecting with other people and communicating and um, sort of being flexible, all of those things that we think of as just the opposite for individuals with autism. So there's a, a great diversity. There's everything from, like I said, one powerful gene, not inherited to things that are inherited, but perhaps a combination of those factors. Um, when it comes to those combination of factors, uh, sometimes you can see in some families, not all families, but in some families, you can see other people with autism. So maybe other siblings, maybe mom, dad, aunt, uncle, cousin. Sometimes you can see other behavioral issues, but not necessarily autism. So you may see other things like attention deficit disorder, um, individuals who have difficulty focusing or attending or concentrating. You may see other people that have other things in terms of obsessions or compulsions, other people with schizophrenia, 
other people with epilepsy, all things that are above the shoulders, as I say. So they're all things that are related to the brain, the mind and behavior, but they may not be exactly autism. And so what we're starting to learn, we haven't quite got this all together, but we're starting to learn is some of those genetic factors uh, may predispose to differences in the way the brain is connected, the way the brain works, but it doesn't always come out exactly the same way in terms of the, the diagnosis that the doctor might give. Okay. Um, so we got a question in about this just now, actually, um, and we also had it on our list for tonight. So um, can Sparks research be helpful for identifying gene changes that are related to other conditions? Um, oh. So could Sparks research lead to discoveries for, for other health conditions, mental health conditions? Right. So um, the answer is yes. Um, you know, we don't always know as we're looking for these genes related to autism what we might find. So I'll just give you one example. Um, one of the genes that's on our Spark gene list, uh, we started out and we found it in individuals with autism. And as we started following them over time uh, through the life course in well into adulthood, and that's another point I'll come back to is uh, we think of everyone along the lifespan in terms of Spark. It's not just children, it's adults. And we wanna continue watching as people uh, mature into adults. But for this one condition, as we were watching them change over life, um, we realized that it was associated with autism, but we also realized that we were starting to see some cancers, some, some atypical cancers that we don't usually see and at younger ages than we would usually see them. With another flavor of autism genetically, again, following people over their lifetime as they were maturing up into adults, we saw that it was associated with a form of Parkinsonism or Parkinson disease. and so even though it starts out and, and it absolutely in those children is autism, I have no doubt about that. We realize it's a particular flavor of autism that has unique features associated with that. And again, to me, that's really important in both of the examples that I gave, because for instance, for the cancer, I wouldn't necessarily be screening as an example for bladder cancer for someone that were in their 20s or 30s, because we just don't usually see that. That's not a usual thing to do. But if I know to look for it, it's really easy to be able to get a urine sample and screen for cancer cells. And so we can translate that into news we can use, information that we can use to take care of our, pe our young people as, they, for instance, they're becoming adults and as they're going through their life course. Um, I think that's especially important, those medical aspects for individuals with autism, because we do know that in terms of their connection with the healthcare system, sometimes they don't get the very best medical care. I'm ashamed to say that as a physician myself, but um, I don't think we're always as understanding. I don't think we have all the time the right accommodations or the right sensitivities to individuals with autism. And because of that, you can understand it's a scary place. There's a lot of bright lights, a lot of white coats, needles in some cases. Um, and so people shy away from that. They may not go to see doctors as often. Um, they may not be as open about expressing what's bothering them. And so there's a delay to diagnosis just in general. And it doesn't matter whether it's cancer or diabetes or asthma, you know, with all of those things, that delay to diagnosis ends up making it more difficult to treat someone. So I think knowing about those things in advance, um, we can number one, just diagnose them at least on time, but hopefully even earlier and at earlier stages when we can do good things. The example I gave for Parkinson's, we know it's responsive to a particular type of medication. And so by knowing that ahead of time, rather than struggling and going through trial and error and trying to think, is it just in your head or is it something real? Again, we start giving people maps, things to look for, things to realize that you know they are real, but there's something that works. There's a medication in this case for uh, dopamine that actually makes this better. And so I think being able to give that guidance um, to folks is what, what can be very helpful. Even if we don't have a cure with a capital C, and in many cases, I don't think we're looking for a cure with a capital C, but looking for things that'll make even just day-to-day -day life a little bit better. And if we could all get that, um, I know I can just say for myself in my own life, you know, anything to make life just a little bit easier is appreciated. Okay. Um, all right. So, can you talk a little bit more about Spark's process for sequencing DNA and returning results? So um, why would it be that one person got a genetic finding but not another person? Sure. 
Um, so I know this is a, a point of frustration for some folks. Um, it feels like I sent in my spit kit, you know, like years ago, and I still haven't heard from you guys. Um, so I totally get that. But let me try and explain this whole process. Um, so the saliva sample comes in. And uh, we go from that and we extract the DNA. And although I wish it worked for everyone, it doesn't always for a variety of reasons. Um, and when it doesn't work, we go through and we go back and we try and salvage whatever we can because we know people tried their very best. Um, but sometimes we end up asking you to send in a new saliva sample, um, especially individuals with autism sometimes have trouble getting uh, enough saliva into the tube or other things happen, but you know, we go back and forth. So that's the first step, just doing that. Um, when we do the sequencing, we don't do one person at a time. So for some of you who may have done 23andMe or Ancestry.com, you sort of have this thing where you do, it feels like the same thing, right? You take a swab or you send a sample and you usually get a result back within a few weeks. And you're thinking like, what are those guys at Spark doing? You know, Ancestry can do it. Why can't you guys do that? Um, well, when Ancestry.com or 23andMe do it, they're, they're taking individual people and they're pushing them through. Um, we're trying to do this, and, and I'll be honest, we're trying to do this in batches so that we can make sure that we do everyone the same way. We want to make sure we can compare information scientifically across everyone. And there are things that if you do it in onesies or twosies, you can get things that we call batch effects, differences between one person and another person that doesn't make the data completely comparable. So we try and do batches, and those batches end up being big, big batches. Sometimes it's only once every six months that we'll do sequencing and it's everyone who came in in that time period and we send them off. At the beginning, no longer, not anymore, but at the beginning we were also focused on um, doing complete families because we had this hope that some of our families that weren't yet complete would become complete. So we wanted to give them time to get in, uh, whether it was a missing brother or a missing father, but we wanted to give them time to come in again because of that batch effect. We wanted to make sure everyone was together and we could compare their data together. And so at the beginning, we took complete families and we pushed them along in terms of doing that. And we were waiting, sort of stalling to see if other people would come along. At some point, we've appreciated that we're going to quit holding our breath and we know some of those families for various reasons aren't going to finish up and that's okay um, but we've decided you know at this point to keep pushing people through at this point i can say we've sequenced about 75,000 individuals in spark so a huge number of people um, and as we're doing it it takes a while it takes a large amount of computing power just to be able to analyze that information um, as we're doing it, uh, it's literally 20,000 genes that we're looking at in terms of doing that. And it's 20,000 genes now and about 75,000 people. And so to be able to run the programs that do what we call alignments and see what the individual genetic variants are and to be able to interpret that literally takes weeks sometimes to be able to go through that process, what we call the pipeline to do that. Now, in some cases, we see particular genes that we know are autism-associated genes, and we see certain types of variants that we've seen before, and those are relatively, <clears throat> excuse me, easy for us to recognize. Again, that's something we've seen before, and so we can say, aha, I've got that one. A lot of time, though, and this is why this is research, we are seeing something for the very first time. And if we see something just once, for the very first time, I can't be sure that's related to autism because for any one of you that are in Spark, you have tens, if not hundreds of thousands of genetic variants that make you different from me. And it's hard for me to understand what the implication is for each one of those variants. Each one of them is not gonna cause autism for sure, right? 99.999% of them are not gonna cause autism. And I've got to sift through all of that. And it's like sifting through sand to find a gold nugget or sifting through and find the needle in the haystack. And so as we're sifting, 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 I'm not always sure that I'm sifting and I've got the right needle or I've got the right nugget. So what I'd like to do is wait and see, do I see anyone else in our Spark group who has the same exact genetic variant or something that looks very similar? And we take a statistical argument. So we're really rigorous with this. As scientists, we want to make sure that we've got a p-value or a probability that this is actually something associated with autism. And we don't trust just me. So it's actually a whole team of scientists behind us 
I want to put a shout out to Dr. Pamela Feliciano in particular, who's the one that leads these efforts. Um, she and her team work tirelessly at looking at this. And then we also have an independent group of uh, medical advisory board. So another group of six individuals who look at this. And as a final double check, this gets checked at an independent clinical genetics laboratory to make sure that they agree with our interpretation. So with this whole process, that takes time. And then as well, sometimes it takes time because maybe three years ago, we saw the first person with a change in this gene. And then two years ago, we saw the second person. And one year ago, we saw the third person. But it's only when we get to the point where we've seen it 10 times, for instance, that we are statistically confident that this really is something. So sometimes we have things that are on our watch list. We're watching and waiting, waiting for more people to have the same thing, to be able to be confident that it actually gets sort of promoted up to be a spark gene and a variant that we report out. And I'll also tell you, there are some things that were on our wait list that actually came off our wait list because we realized we were wrong. Those really weren't autism genes. They were things that we hadn't seen before, but it was because, as an example, it might have been someone who was from a part of the world who wasn't someone we've seen as much of. So let me, let me unpack that a little bit. So most of the individuals we have to be able to compare people to, to see whether they're similar or different genetically, are originally of European ancestry. So they're from companies like, or countries rather like Germany or England or France, maybe Italy. <clears throat> and we have a lot of individuals in terms of being able to compare to for things like that. On the other hand, in Spark, I'm very proud to say we have a very diverse community. So we have people who are Chinese or Iranian or from Ghana or from Czechoslovakia or Japan. I mean, all parts of the world, right? The problem is if I haven't seen enough people from that part of the world, I might mistakenly think that a genetic variant that I'm seeing is actually causative for autism, but in fact, it's not. It's just a normal genetic variant for someone from Ghana, but I just don't have many people from Ghana in our data set. And so I make a, an erroneous association. So we try and be careful about what we're doing. We want to be really rigorous. We don't want to uh, no backsies, as my son would say. Um, you know, we don't want to take any information back because we've made a mistake. And because of that, you know, it takes a little bit longer. Um, I'll also say, and I've said this in some of my other videos, for any of you who have a sense of urgency, there's a real, you need an answer right away, whether it be because there's something going on with your child or your, uh, the member of your family, or maybe you're concerned about something specific, maybe you have a question about uh, your pregnancy and you suddenly you know, wanna, want some clarity in terms of whether or not there's something that you should be looking for after the baby's born. If there's any sense of urgency, um, let me say, please do go see a medical geneticist. You can ask your doctor to make a referral. Um, many of us are seeing patients even via Zoom, you know, to make it easier uh, in COVID times. Um, but a medical geneticist, uh, you know, who just like a neurologist or a developmental pediatrician, they know you specifically. They know all about you. They'll, um, you know, be able to move things along faster using clinical testing if there's a real urgency or need from that. Of course, we're going to continue doing the research. We're going to continue finding new things that, you know, maybe wouldn't come up in a clinical lab because we're just continuing to research this over time. Um, but if there is, like I said, something that's urgent, I don't want you to be neglected. Uh, I want to make sure that you're getting the right care. Okay. Um, so related to that, how, how many people are getting results these days? Like if, if you could say a percentage of, of people yep. that have sent samples in. Yeah, so a good round number is about 10% of the SPARC community is or is in the process of getting a result related to autism. Um, so with that, these are all factors that we think are single genes, right? I talked about some single genes. I talked about a whole combination of genes. None of this combination of gene stuff. These are all the single genes that we're talking about within this. And as I said, for the majority of those single genes, we're finding that those are things that started new with the child with autism. They, for the most part, weren't inherited things, although we're returning inherited results as well. So it's not as if we're only returning one class or the other. Um, but the answer right now is about 10%, and I expect that number will increase over time. Okay. Um, all right. So um, 
So you talked about 23andMe earlier. Um, we got uh, a few people that asked this question. Can Spark participants download their DNA like you can in, yeah. in a service like 23andMe? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for anyone who's an aficionado or is really into this stuff, um, right now Spark is doing predominantly two types of uh, genetic data generation. One is to generate a lot of what they call single nucleotide variants or common genetic differences. That is similar in some ways to what people get from Ancestry.com. We're doing it not necessarily because we're trying to figure out whether your great, 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 great grandfather came from France or Paris, um, you know, but we're doing it to, again, look at the, the autism issues. Um, but we're doing that, what they call SNP genotyping, and then we're also doing something called exome sequencing. And that's a fancy way of saying that we're looking at all those 20,000 genes I talked about, but we're looking at the portion of the, um, the code that encodes for the protein um, or the gene products or what gets made from those genes. Um, it's a little bit of a shortcut. Um, that way we only look at about 2% of your genetic information all told, but it gives us what we think is a lot of good information. Um, with that, we don't have a portal that you can just go and log in and see on your dashboard, for instance, uh, you know, whether or not your urine should smell differently after you have asparagus for dinner. So we don't have anything like that set up. Um, I don't think it's something that many people are going to want, but if there is a reason that you think you need to have your data, um, we will have an option for you to be able to write into us and we will send you, it's not gonna be sort of interpreted in terms of, like I said, whether or not your family came from France or whether or not your urinal smell like asparagus. So it's not gonna be that 23andMe type of service. Um, but if it's something that you need and maybe there's a medical issue that's going on in your family and you think that information might be helpful, um, yes, we will get you that information. Okay. Um, we get this question a lot as well. Um, so people want to know if the genetic analyses that we're doing could determine if someone has autism. So if they didn't have a diagnosis oh. already. Okay. Um, so that's it, it, embedded within that question. I'm going to answer something, a question that people often ask me about when I give them the results. So I actually, um, for instance, have been able to talk with some of our Spark participants about the results and what they mean. And one question I get very frequently is, um, well, thank you, Dr. Chung, for telling me about gene X or gene Y. Uh, does that mean I don't have autism anymore? Um, and these are really two, they're, they're related things, but they're different in some way. So they're, they're I think of them as orthogonal or uh, at right angles to each other in the sense that autism is a description of your behavior. And the genetic diagnosis is a description of your genes and that gene may predispose you to have a certain type of behavioral pattern. It certainly is contributing to that, but the gene itself doesn't map one-to-one -one necessarily with autism. So I don't know of any gene so far that I've studied or that the community has identified for autism where it's a one-to-one -one match where anyone that has that particular gene or genetic variant necessarily has autism, right? And in fact, for most of the genes that we've studied, and I've studied an awful lot of them, it will be about 25% of those individuals will have a diagnosis of autism. Now, for many of those genes, it may be that there's a different behavioral manifestation or a different manifestation of the brain or the mind. So as I talked about, in some of these conditions, someone might have epilepsy, not autism, but have epilepsy. Other individuals might have autism and epilepsy. Other individuals might not have either, but have problems with speech. Um, so they can map in different ways and some of that complexity about what a gene is going to map to, I have to, I, I can certainly say I can't predict that. So if I just saw this in terms of, you know, saw a readout and then someone said, well, now tell me what that person looks like. I might be able to give you a general idea that you know it was one of five different things, but I don't think I could tell you with certainty exactly what that person you know was manifesting uh, in terms of a behavioral profile. 
So with that, though, uh, I do hope what we're able to do is when we have those together, understanding for what their genes are, as well as how they're manifesting, uh, and knowing that that changes after the life course, I do think we're going to have some greater specificity to understand, as an example, educational strategies that might be more helpful. Um, if you know that person's sort of brain profile in terms of what things are easier and what things are harder for them to learn or ways to learn, I hope we'll be able to develop workarounds or systems that might be just easier to be able to take in information. And one of the things I think I have learned over the past, say, I don't know, 25 years or so, is I've been, I, I would say, surprised very in a very pleasant way at how much potential young people have that, and I have to admit, I was at fault for this 25 years ago, um, about not appreciating as much how, how much potential they have and potentially uh, selling some of my younger patients short in terms of thinking that um, when they weren't talking to me, it was because they weren't understanding me. I now appreciate now that we have more technology available, now that I know how to listen and look better, um, just how much is going on inside some people's heads. And they may have difficulty expressing themselves, um, but it doesn't mean that they're not thinking, they're not understanding, they're not appreciating. And again, you know, as we have more assisted communication devices, as we have more ways of being able to allow people to express themselves and support them, especially with early intervention, I think they're able to achieve more and able to be able to engage more. And so um, I hope in doing that, like I said, we'll be able to figure out educational strategies, who's a visual learner, who's an auditory learner, um, be able to help in terms of some of our therapies to make sure that they're geared and, you know, sort of targeted in the right direction uh, for individuals. But, but I still don't have a crystal ball. I still can't tell perfectly exactly how someone's going to turn out. So my, I always say I hope for the best um, as we're doing this and we want to allow every person to achieve their full potential. Okay. All right. I'm going to take a look at some of the questions that we got in um, live here. So um, someone was asking if there's been any genetic connection between autism and Tourette's that you know of. Oh, okay. Um, so Tourette's is, for those that don't know, Tourette's is also another behavioral manifestation. Um, I would say these are not the closest cousins in terms of different behavioral conditions. But I won't be surprised if at the end of the day, we do find some genetic factors that are overlapping between the two. Um, but I do think they're, they're going to be different enough that we'll also see many differences as well. Okay, another question that came in um, from the chat here is, um, if you could talk a little bit more about stem cell therapy. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's lots of talk around that as it, as it relates to autism. Um, yeah. If you could just share a little bit more. Yeah, I'm going to be pretty blunt here because um, I do. I, I personally have been disappointed that I don't think scientists have been as honest with families as they should have been. Um, so let me try and explain for some of you who don't know what the stem cell therapy is. Stem cells, so we all have stem cells within our body. Um, stem cells can be able to grow and rejuvenate certain tissue. Um, so they're in your heart and we have ways of being able to rejuvenate tissue there. And the hope would be that you could use stem cells to rejuvenate the brain to be able to replace uh, cells that might have a problem. So um, I don't know how many you may, of you may have done it, but some of you may have banked your children's cord blood samples. So after the baby was born, there's stem cells in the cord blood. And so there's a whole industry that's come up in terms of banking those samples. Well, some people had the idea that those stem cells you could give back to the person. So either you could give them back their own stem cells or if there's if you thought there was something genetically wrong with that person you wouldn't necessarily want to give them back their own cells because that would still have the same genetic problem but maybe you could give them someone else's stem cells and that would be able to be kind of like gene therapy it would have the right genes and it would be able to go back in the body and rejuvenate the body repopulate the body get up into the brain and hopefully be able to bring in new good brain cells that would then function differently well, uh, the problem is, is that the body is, has an immune system and that immune system is designed to recognize when there's an invader, um, when there's foreign, something foreign coming into your body. 
it attacks it, it gobbles it up, it destroys it, and it gets rid of it. Otherwise, you know, we'd get infected. Um, in fact, that's what's going on with COVID right now and other infections. So in fact, and I can say I've done this with some of my own patients that went for these types of treatments, um, you can go after the treatment is done. So if one of my patients went and then got some of those stem cells, I can actually look in their body to see, do I see any evidence of anyone else genetically besides them? In other words, I can, if it would came from someone else, I should be able to see a genetic signature of someone else's DNA in their body. And so we've done that over time. And in fact, uh, shown at least to my satisfaction that the body does what it was intended to do, which is that it takes the cells out and it destroys them and gets rid of them. So they're really not in the body, populating the body. And in fact, we know that um, the way we can, the, the only way we can get that to work is when we do medically something called a bone marrow transplant. And when we do that, we give chemotherapy or radiation to in fact destroy the immune system so that it can't fight back. And in that very specific circumstance, again, where we go to extreme measures to take out the immune system, uh, we can get that to work. But um, that's not the, the scenario that we're talking about in terms of most people getting stem cells. So I'll admit, you know, I've had patients who have gone all the way around the world in terms of, you know, being able to follow some of those treatments. I have yet to see, and I've seen, you know, I don't know, probably all told over a hundred patients who have tried strategies like that. I have yet to see a single patient in whom that's worked. So I, I feel very strongly about that. The stem cell therapy, I'm not saying it, there aren't maybe someday ways that, that it's going to be helpful, but right now that technology is not mature. Um, we had a question about family planning. And so if someone has a child with autism, um, you know, based on your experience and, and genetics, you know, how likely could it be that they would have another child with autism? How does that play a role? Yeah, that's a very common question. And um, again, I'll say for anyone who wants to get very specific into their nitty gritty, uh, do be sure you talk with a local genetic counselor or geneticist to make sure that, you know, the generic answers I'm going to give you are really true for your family. Um, so as I said before, you know, it depends a little bit on the, if you will, the severity of or associated features that we see with autism. So in some families, um, the, the recurrence risk or the chance that they'll have another child with autism if they've had one child with autism could be close to zero. Um, again, if it's one of those de novo or new genetic events, then it usually doesn't happen again. And so that, you know, they're, they're like everyone else in the population, you know, a little bit less than one in a hundred. Um, the way to answer that question, and this may or may not sort of make sense, but the way to answer your question, are you in that bucket, are you in that group, is to actually go and get a genetic evaluation for your child with autism, understand if you can, is there an identifiable genetic cause, and then the doctors will be able to fine tune the answer to you and your family. Um, if I were to take just every, you know, if I would take all families with autism, put them all in a bucket and randomly pick out one family and say, what's the chance? Um, it is definitely, if you've had one child with autism, the odds are much higher to have another child with autism. It can be as high as one in five. So those numbers can get higher. Um, and some people feel like that's a big number. Um, the chance to have another child with autism is higher if it's a boy. And that's because as we know, uh, boys are more likely to have autism, about four to one, boys to girls. Um, and if you have more than one child with autism, so if you have two or three or four, then the odds go up from there. So the first scenario that I told you about is just having one child with autism. So again, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't know if anything that I just said applies to you in particular, um, for whomever asked that question, or maybe, maybe several people had the question, um, but do be sure and go and talk with your own obstetrician or pediatrician, uh, and they'll be able to fine tune the answer that I gave you to your circumstance. Okay. Um, all right. So another question here about, um, <clears throat> So I, you might be able to answer this, I'm not sure. Someone was asking about if there's any evidence of um, seizure medications having any kind of interaction with cognitive function. Oh, um, so the, the brief answer is yes, absolutely. Um, 
So this is a little bit for those of you who don't have individuals in your family with seizures, you can just uh, go to the restroom and take a break. But um, for seizures, seizures, <clears throat> excuse me, are like an electrical thunderstorm in your head. And it's hard to think clearly when you've got seizures going on. And in fact, some people after their seizure will be quite sleepy and out of it. So one of the problems is that, um, so that's just general if you have seizures and if they're not treated. So that's, that's not a good situation. Some of the medications that we use for seizures will dampen down that electricity, um, will make it so that you don't have that electrical storm, but they can be too much. And so some medications may even may be sedating, may make you sleepy, may make you drowsy, may make you out of it. And so the medication itself, it's doing a good job of suppressing the seizures, but it's also doing a good job of suppressing a lot of the thoughts you're having. And so there's a really fine balance in terms of making sure that you've got the seizures under control, um, but that you don't overly sedate someone so that they can still function, so they can learn, so they can you know, be, be a part of life. Um, so that's not necessarily just one medication. It's for all medications. Oftentimes there are differences in dosage and uh, really epileptologists have an art in terms of being able to find the right medication for the right type of seizure. And as I was saying, I do hope at some point that if we know some of the genetics of epilepsy and of autism, uh, we can do a better job of not so much trial and error. I'm not saying it'll be perfect the first time, but at least we'll make fewer adjustments to medications. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll ask this question. I'll try to make it a little more broad too. So um, someone says that they had asphyxia, um, I imagine, right? So Birth. In birth, I imagine, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if that could be related to autism. And similarly, are there any other sort of birth related complications that might be associated sure. with autism? Sure. So this is, I think, a very common question. I, I call it why, right? You know, in terms of why did this happen? Um, and as I said, it's not all about genes. Um, and in some cases, it's a combination. So um, one of the causes, or not causes, let me call it contributing factors, because um, I don't know that it's a single cause, prematurity in general. And the more premature the baby is, the greater the risk in terms of autism. So uh, if normal gestation is 30 weeks, 36 weeks, or if normal gestation, I'm sorry, is 37 weeks, um, 36 weeks is a tiny little risk factor. That's not mostly what I'm talking about. But if you've got someone who was born at 27 weeks, you know, like a really premature baby, um, that's a big risk factor in terms of autism. Um, we don't exactly understand the phenomenology, but there are some women who were infect infected with something, and it's not necessarily just one virus or one cold or, you know, exactly that we've got that figured out. But there's evidence that women who are infected during pregnancy may have an increased risk uh, for autism um, in their offspring, in their child. And whether that's the actual virus itself or something that causes the infection, um, whether that's something about the mother's immune system, whether it's some of what comes with fighting an infection, we don't entirely know and it may not always be the same thing. Uh, we also know that there are certain medications. Uh, in fact, in some cases, when the mother takes a medication for seizures, we know that can increase the risk for autism. And then there are things that have to do with, uh, and this is what I think the um, whoever wrote in was asking about, there's some forms of traumatic deliveries. Um, so when there may be a period when the cord was kinked or when the baby was in a position that they were deprived of oxygen for some period of time, or when there was bleeding or hemorrhage into the brain. And so there was what we call a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, any of those things that deprive the baby of oxygen or that cause literal damage to the brain um, can predispose to autism. Um, in some cases, I have to say remarkably so, babies' brains are resilient and many of them bounce back. And so it's not the case that every one of those babies will go on to autism, but it can be a risk factor. And so, you know, we do some things as uh, in the delivery room, like we measure these things called APGAR scores. 
uh, named after Virginia Apgar to see does it look like the baby's breathing well, the heart rate's good. Um, and you know, babies that have high scores, a good score or a high score is good in these cases. You know, if a baby has a score of nine, it's usually not evidence of this problem. But if a baby comes out the chute and has a score of two or three, that oftentimes tells us that there's a risk for something like autism or developmental delay related to the delivery. Okay. Um, all right. So um, someone's asking about um, scripting or echolalia, echolalia um, and if you've seen that improve over time or is it sort of dependent on the person? Yeah. So it definitely, I would say, depends on the person and their developmental status and to a certain extent even depends on the sort of acute circumstances of what's going on. Um, so as you can imagine, some people do things repetitively um, because it gives them a certain level of comfort or because it's something that's socially expected. Um, so I see sometimes those things differ for those reasons. Um, some people have particular phrases that they use and they use the same phrase, you know, frequently. Um, and, you know, there's that. Other people, when they're talking about echolalia, specifically talk about their repeating back um, specific phrases. And, and so I see both of those. Uh, like I said, in some cases, I see it during particular, either particular people um, when they interact and they that like that's their relationship, that's the thing they do with that person. Sometimes it's um, um, sort of, I can see because sometimes they're more anxious in those circumstances. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think part of it is trying to draw out from someone and being able to, you know, get them to say different things, oftentimes with their speech therapists. And then um, as we're trying to reinforce some of those speech therapy lessons, sometimes it's by, you know, literally changing the scenery and, you know, being able to get off onto another subject. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, sometimes those, those are challenging, I appreciate. Um, okay, so um, so we talked a lot about genetic testing. Um, are there any other kinds of tests that you would recommend or that are evidence-based for um, children or adults with autism? So I'll say some things that I'm seeing that a lot of people um, go to be able to get uh, different different doctors looking at. So what do people I have often come into my office with? Sometimes they'll come in with metabolic tests. So they'll go and they'll get either a urine test or a blood test that says, what are my levels of amino acids or what is my MTHR, MTHFR, which happens to be a genetic test, but one very specific one. Um, or what does it say in terms of my carnitine levels or various things like that. Um, I will say that I, I'm trying to think. I have yet to actually have a patient that I've diagnosed with a real true inborn error of metabolism that came in with any of those types of studies. I'm not saying it can't happen because I told you a story tonight about phenylketonuria that can masquerade it like this. So it can happen, but it often, it, it's not usual that it happens that way. So that's, I just say it because it's something that a lot of autism parents go and get that type of test. Um, another type of test I sometimes see is looking at things like um, epigenetics. You know, can I do a very specific type of test looking for epigenetics and does that tell me about autism? And short of, again, I mentioned this condition, short of Angelman syndrome, I usually don't see that being helpful. So I think people end up sort of spinning their wheels in that space. Um, some people ask me or wonder about um, different you know, I've seen everything from taking a clip of hair or taking a saliva sample or taking a stool sample and looking for toxins. You know, is there something in terms of a toxic exposure and can we purge that out of the system? Um, again, it's pretty rare that that happens. I'm not saying that someone can't have a lead overload and, you know, be able to get the lead out of their system. That can happen and lead is one of the easiest or most common ones to do. Um, but those don't usually end up showing us the answer. But, you know, I understand people are looking for something that's treatable. And if it's treatable, even if it's a long shot, you'd feel stupid if you missed it. So I get that. Um, but just to go in, not with the expectation it's going to be the answer. It's more of a rule out situation if you go into it, you know, trying to get that testing. Okay. All right. Just one more, because I think you can answer this pretty easily. Um, how does Fragile X relate to autism? 
Oh, that's great. So fragile X is one of these conditions, one of these genetic conditions, where it ends up being, again, about 20, 25% of the folks with that have autism. Um, but it's uh, on the X chromosome. So it's one of these X linked conditions. And we tend to see more boys than girls with this condition. Okay. All right. Well, we're out of time now. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we got through a, a good number of questions here.